everyone, and welcome to Wellness Wednesday, presented by the University of Arizona Health Sciences. I'm Caroline Berger, Director of Corporate and Community Relations in Phoenix. I'd like to introduce you to our team, led by Allison O2, our Executive Director, and also Anne-Marie Medina, our Director in Tucson. We want to thank you for joining us today for this health and wellness lunch break. First, I'd like to introduce you to the wonderful world of health sciences. Welcome to the University of Arizona Health Sciences. As the statewide leader in biomedical research and health professions training, health sciences includes College of Medicine Tucson, College of Medicine Phoenix, College of Nursing, College of Pharmacy, and the Melanie Zuckerman College of Public Health. Together, they provide cutting edge health education, breakthrough research, and a diverse offering of community outreach services. At the heart of health sciences, our employees, nearly 5,000 along with 4,000 students, makes us one of the top employers in the state. Our growing research and education programs are offered on two campuses, one at the main campus in Tucson, and the other in the heart of downtown Phoenix on the biomedical campus. The University of Arizona Health Sciences is a major contributor to U Arizona's well-earned reputation as one of the country's top research institutions. And each year, we receive more than $200 million in research grants and contracts, providing vital funding to help address some of our most critical healthcare challenges. We are grateful for this support which is fueling discoveries and treatments in areas including cardiovascular disease, cancer, Alzheimer's disease, and now COVID-19. The University of Arizona Health Sciences is also in a unique position to affect change in a rapidly shifting healthcare landscape. As part of our strategic plan, we have developed a set of initiatives to reshape the future of healthcare. We are focusing our efforts on five important areas next generation education, precision health care for all, making wellness ageless, creating defenses against disease, and new frontiers for better health. Through these strategic initiatives, we have unprecedented opportunities to excel in education and research in more and better ways than ever before, and we invite you to join us on this journey. Please know that our dedicated corporate and community relations team is here to be your connector with health sciences. Thank you for your dedication and for all that you do to make our communities healthy. So as you can imagine, there is a lot going on in our world. And we invite you to stay informed and up to date on the latest news and information, particularly on our research breakthroughs. So we invite you to visit us at uahs.arizona.edu and be sure to follow us at all the social media platforms. And I want to extend an invitation for you to follow me on Twitter at C.E. Berger. And be sure to tag your post hashtag wellnesswednesdays.az. Well, today is going to be a very interesting session. I said it's one of those that's going to be great to know, but maybe a little scary to know about what's going on in your home that may be not right in front of you that you can see. So we invite you to leave a question in the chat function. We want this to be as interactive, as engaging as possible. So please leave questions in there and comments as we go through. Also, after today, you will receive an email, which will include a brief link to a quick survey. So we'd like to get your thoughts on today's program. You will also be, be sure to receive all the links and resources that are talked about today. So you'll have those at your fingertips. Plus, you'll also have today's recording, so you can look at it again and be sure to share it with family and friends or anyone else living in your home, because this is going to be great information to know. Plus, you'll be able to get links to all of our past Wellness Wednesday sessions, a whole year's worth of great health and wellness tips and information. So today, we are going to be talking about home hygiene, keeping your home clean, safe, and healthy. Today's presenter is Dr. Kelly Remnitz, Professor and Chair of the Department of Community Environment and Policy and Director of the Environment, Exposure Science and the Risk Assessment Center at the University of Arizona. Since 1990, Dr. Reynolds has served as a researcher and public health educator in environmental science, specializing in water quality, food safety and disease transmission. 
She received her doctorate degree from the University of Arizona in Agriculture and Life Science and a master's degree from the University of South Florida, my alma mater, by the way, in the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health. So please welcome Dr. Kelly Lennon. Thank you, Caroline, and thanks, thanks to all of you for attending today. I promise that after today's session, you will look at your home a little bit differently. So we'll go right into the slide deck here. And I'm trying to share, and it's saying that I can't share yet. It says, Caroline, that you're still sharing. Oops, here we go, now it's working, great. Okay, so as Caroline mentioned, we're going to talk about home hygiene today and how you keep your home clean, safe, and healthy, especially when there might be somebody in the household that is ill. And if you want in more information about the kind of work we're doing in my laboratory in environmental health sciences, check out the website at esrac.arizona.edu for up-to-date information on all the activities that we're doing. This is just a small snippet of the great research that's going on in our department. So let's talk about, I like to call it the unhealthy home because the home is actually the central transfer site of germs. You will most likely be in contact with a germ in your own household than any other public area. And why is that? Well, even before COVID-19, we tended to keep our distance from people. We stayed away from things that look dirty, but in our own home, we have this perception that our homes are clean even when they're not because it's our environment, it's our germs, and we're not as concerned about hygiene outside of the home. This is what a lot of our surveys have told us and a lot of observational studies that we've conducted. So in this picture are my three little germ factories. The youngest actually just turned 18 last week. So this is not a very recent picture, but this is the time when they were going to school, they were going to preschool, coming home, and it just seemed like somebody was always sick. In amongst the three of them. And so that's when I really started focusing more on upping my hygiene game in the home because I wanted to protect my kids. And I knew that we were all being exposed to more germs because of all of the activity the kids were having outside and their interactions with other children. At that age, there's just a lot of germs being circulated and, and exchanged. So that's the time when I really started focusing more on home hygiene as part of my research as well. So if you look at some of the data, we know that germs recirculating in our homes cause up to 50% of all diarrheal illness, and that can be from tap water alone, up to 80% of foodborne disease. More mistakes are made in food preparation in the home that could lead to adverse health outcomes than in any restaurant. And part of that is because restaurant employees are trained on proper um, handling of food, proper hand washing, there's signage all over to wash your hands. Do you think about that as often as those critical moments of when you should be washing your hands or not cross-contaminating cutting boards and other surfaces with raw meats in your home as what probably restaurant employees are trained? And what we find is that in the home, people are a lot more relaxed about some of those protocols. And we also know that up to 60% of respiratory infections are transmitted in the home. And those are the, the exchanges of flus and colds between family members that happens quite a bit. So we're, we're, we've gotten pretty good, especially with COVID awareness about isolating ourselves when we're ill, but you're still in the household with other family members. And even before COVID, our recommendation was if somebody in the home is sick, they should be isolated to a single room so that they are not cross-contaminating the entire household. So I'll show you some information about how we know that occurs. But first, let's start with water. I threw out there that water in the home can be contaminated. And we know that water deteriorates significantly in the distribution system. So even though our water utilities are providing good, clean water, as the water gets delivered to you and sits stagnant in pipes and storage tanks, the bacterial count grows. This was a study done at the University of Arizona looking at our groundwater source in Tucson and the level of bacteria in our pristine groundwater. And the levels range between one and 10 colony forming units of bacteria per milliliter of water, a very clean water supply. Once that water was put into the distribution system, and in Arizona, certain times of the year, the water gets heated up quite a bit, and that helps promote the regrowth of bacteria. You can get a 10 to 100 fold increase in bacterial concentrations. And then look what happens when it sits in your household taps. You can get a dramatic increase up to a million bacteria per milliliter of water, just as it sits in your pipes. 
And if some of you are snowbirds in our area, you know that you leave your home in Tucson for a long period of time, but do you know what's happening to your water quality over that period of time? When you return, you should be flushing your taps to get that residual bacteria cleared from your system before you drink that water or before you shower with that water. We know that stagnant water, if it sits even for a period, if you just go on a brief vacation for a week or two at a time, these numbers can increase to this level. So your home water system can be the source of Legionella, of Mycobacterium avium, of Helicobacter pylori. These are all pathogenic organisms that can cause disease. So a simple solution is to flush your system when you have any periods of long-term stagnation, again, a week or two or even more. And also I'm a big proponent of point of use filtration because like your RO systems, things like that at the household level, because that can guard against any unknown events that can happen. And we know about a lot of unknown events. There was a very large cryptosporidium outbreak in Milwaukee in the tap water system, the lead events in Flint, Michigan, these were all sort of surprises that happened. In hindsight, we should have been able to predict them a little bit better, but the, the end of the story is that a lot of people were exposed and a lot of people got sick. So, so those are some strategies with your tap water that can be very important. Now, this isn't maybe necessarily a home hygiene issue, but it could be if you own a swimming pool. And an understanding about swimming being one of the greatest activities, the largest, most frequent activities across the U.S., and certainly in our region of increased temperatures in Tucson, Arizona, a lot of swimming is going on. But there is a low awareness of hygiene practices. Many people have the perception that a chlorinated swimming pool is a great place to just rinse off dirty kids. <laughs> We've actually seen people change diapers beside the, the side of the pool. And instead of really bathing or washing their child, we'll actually dunk them in the pool, thinking that the chlorine in the swimming pool will kill any germs that might be present. And that's just not so. In fact, if you have had a diarrheal illness, the recommendation from the CDC is that you don't get into a pool with other people for up to two weeks after your symptoms have subsided. So that can be really hard to do if you consider that you're going to Disney World on vacation and your kid gets sick on the way there. And then you're going to tell them you can't swim in the hotel pool for two weeks. But that's the guideline because that is a way that germs can get transmitted. Now, if we look at the overall recreational waterborne disease data, this is CDC information. In 1978, we started tracking these infections, and in around 2007, we reached an all-time high for recreational waterborne disease. And so we've, we've been looking for it more, so we're finding more, but we also have emerging pathogens like cryptosporidium that are not killed by the chlorine in swimming pools. And so filtration is a necessary step to make sure that you get chlorine-resistant organisms out of pools. So we're still discovering that piece of how, you know, what's the best strategy to make maintain good recreational hygiene, even in treated venues. So this is something I hear a lot. And so I like to put it in talks just for people to think about. And, you know, a lot of us are thinking, well, is an exposure to germs good for you? It builds your immunity. And I propose that there's a lot of illnesses that you can come into contact with that you don't build immunity to. And that's why they're the primary things that we're concerned about. So influenza is a good example, the common cold. There's so many different variants to that strain of virus that you can become reinfected over and over again. And a lot of us now have firsthand knowledge about that potentially occurring with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. We're all wondering, will my vaccine protect me next year like it's protecting me this year? And that's why we say preventing exposure is your first line of defense against germs. You'll be exposed to plenty of bacteria that are just indigenous in our environment, but what we want to avoid is exposure to germs. These are the bacteria and viruses that will make you sick. So that's something to think about as we move forward. So in this video, and a lot of us again are very well aware of aerosols now and how they spread and how far we need to be apart. And some of the guidance from the CDC about that six foot distancing came from this type of a video visually observing how far aerosols from a sneeze can spread. And this was done about 80 years ago to determine that aerosol droplets that are, are visible will spread about six feet. 
Now, we know now that there are many droplets that are not visible that can spread a lot further, maybe even 60 feet. So, um, but the large droplets that have the highest concentration of viruses tend to stay around six feet. And what happens around six feet of your body? Well, notice in this video, as the droplets are settling, they're settling very close to the person sneezing. And so you can have coverage of those droplets on your clothing, in your lap. If you're sitting down, a lot of those droplets will settle right on your lap. So your laundry, your clothing can be heavily contaminated over time, especially if you're sick. And so I have a lot of guidance and a lot of research about how to maintain good laundry hygiene in the home. And we'll touch on it briefly here. But if you go to the Ezraq website, you can learn a lot more about how you can prevent and mitigate exposures from just practicing good laundry hygiene. But moving forward again, I mentioned that um, we get a lot of colds. Children can actually experience six to 10 colds per year. So they can continue to get reinfected over time and adults two to four colds per year. So we really want to, again, prevent those exposures from occurring in the first place. And flu season, you know, we think about flu season being at a certain time of year, and you hear a lot about it in media at certain times of the year. And you may think I need to practice better hygiene during flu season. But flu can actually be transmitted. The season itself stretches from about September to May. So a large portion of our year can be flu season. It's the top leading uh, cause of death in the United States. And vaccination, just like with COVID-19, is a primary strategy for preventing infection with the flu. If somebody in your home is sick with the flu, up to 80% of the services throughout your household will be covered with the flu virus. And that, again, is why it's important to isolate that person, disinfect surfaces so we're not getting transmission to other members of the household. So other ways you can get exposed in your, in your home, when we uh, test households, we find about 95% of homes test positive for MRSA. That's a staph uh, bacteria that causes staph infections and can be very resistant to antibacterial or antibiotic treatment. And so we, again, because we have resistant strains of bacteria that can be difficult to treat, preventing exposure in the first place is very important. Now, where do we find MRSA? MRSA likes to survive on dry surfaces, on hand towels, so important to change those frequently, on pet beds, so make sure you're washing the beds that your pets sleep in, and on children's car seats. So the covers of children's car seats, that's something you want to take off the seat and wash periodically. I recommend weekly um, to wash these types of surfaces to keep those germ counts low. Um, we also find that mold is very prevalent in, in indoor environments, in homes. We find a high percentage, percentage of services testing positives, positive in homes. And these are services where you see a lot of moisture. So in shower environments, kitchen environments, even windowsills where, you, where you'll have lots of condensa condensation around your refrigerator, mold doesn't cause illness in a lot of people. Um, typically only people that are sensitive. So if you have allergies and asthma, you want to step up your game for sanitizing services that test positive for mold. Now, dishcloths. A lot of people don't change their dishcloth when they're washing dishes until it starts to smell. That's way too late. <laughs> if you can see or smell bacteria or mold, you have a lot of bacteria or mold in the, in the order of millions um, in that environment. So we want to make sure the CDC guidance is actually that you use your towels once and your dishcloths once, and then you throw them in the laundry. Unless you plan to bleach them in between use and dry them completely, and things do dry very well in our climate in Tucson, Arizona, so you might be able to stretch out that use if they dry completely between use because drying will kill a lot of bacteria and viruses. And then I mentioned laundry hygiene. Um, when you wash your laundry, the, most germs get killed in the drying step. So if you're transferring wet laundry from the washing machine after you washed it to the dryer, chances are your hands are covered in E. coli, which is a fecal bacterium that can cause illness. And if there's somebody in the household that's sick and the laundry was contaminated with either feces or vomit that carries germs, then your hands will be covered with those germs as well. So don't go make a salad after you've handled clean laundry because you may be contaminating your salad and the entire family's meal with E. coli. So make sure the strategy is very simple. Wash your hands after handling what you perceive as clean laundry. But after the laundry's dried, you should be okay. 
So the next bullet point here has nothing to really to do with the home environment, but when you go outside of the home, we've done a study looking at bodily fluids, which, which we know transmit pathogens are rampant on surfaces in playground equipment where there's lots of children, a lot of mucus and saliva that can, can transmit pathogens, but also shopping cart handles. By the way, it was U of A research that you have to thank for all the disinfecting wipes at the grocery store. We were the first to do the study showing that shopping carts can transmit disease. And then we testified in front of a lot of congressional committees and um, state health departments helped them get initiatives on the ballot in their states that this would be an important control strategy to have disinfecting wipes at a central transfer site in grocery stores. So now they're seen everywhere and we work with disinfecting companies to make sure that they donate those or put them in place in grocery stores and develop products to address that issue. So I've talked a lot about um, fomites. These are surfaces that can become contaminated. Your cell phone is a hotspot for contamination. Um, you know, your computer keyboard, your computer mouse, anything you touch a lot, but don't disinfect frequently are hotspots for germ transfer. So think about what fomites in your household might serve that role and be sure to disinfect them periodically. Now, why is this important? Children in particular touch surfaces and then touch their mouth frequently throughout the day. Um, children every hour under the age of two years of age touch their face 81 times per hour. So that's basically constantly. And in this picture of the cute little baby here, they just have their mouth. They do a lot of teething events with their fist in their mouth almost continuously at that age. So that is a potential for germ transfer. So you want to make sure the environments that they're crawling in, playing in, and the surfaces that they're touching are decontaminated routinely so that they're not um, getting exposed to germs. As kids get older, they tend to have less hand to mouth um, frequency. And adults, by the way, the hand to mouth frequency is anywhere between five and 15 per hour. So it's really important to think about your behaviors and how germs can get transmitted. You wanna wash your hands frequently because without even realizing it or knowing it, you are touching your eyes, your nose and your mouth. And those are the transfer sites for germs to get into the body. So we've done a lot of studies. This was an office study that we did. We actually did it at the College of Public Health where there's about 80 employees on the second floor of Drockman Hall. And what we initially did was seed a single person's hands and we also seeded a single um, entry doorknob, a fomite, into the office building at separate times. And we evaluated how that single contamination event contaminated potentially the entire office area. And even we were surprised, the germ experts here were surprised that four hours into the workday, 52% of employee hands, coworker hands were um, contaminated with that same simulated germ. And over 50% of the surfaces throughout the office building were also contaminated. So if you're the one person that goes to work sick, you're potentially exposing half of your coworkers and contaminating half of the office surfaces from um, going to work sick as a single individual. And if there's multiple people going to work sick, we expect that contamination level to increase even more. So very important if you're sick to stay home. And that message has been loud and clear in the current pandemic. Now look what happens when we apply simple interventions. This is the right side of the graph. When we gave employees in the workspace disinfecting wipes and hand sanitizer. And we said, please use these. We didn't watch if they used them. We didn't determine how much they used. And by the way, only half of the employees even said, okay, I'll take your products and I'll try them out. So half of the people didn't even comply with an enhanced uh, hygiene strategy. But what we found was that even with low compliance, you can reduce the risk of, of exposure, contamination and infection by about 80%. So look at the dramatic reduction on the right side of this graph. So what we know is that disinfecting products really work, hand sanitizers really work, and there's simple protocols to put in place. Now there is a difference between cleaning and hygiene. Cleaning is getting rid of dirt, Hygiene is reducing infection. And the only way you can achieve hygiene and reduce infection risk is by using the proper products. And those are products labeled as disinfectants. The other important thing to think about is that the cleaning tools you're using can also spread germs. Sometimes people who clean more have more germs spread throughout their household. And that's because they're either not using the right disinfecting products, they're only using maybe soap and water cleaners, 
or they're not decontaminating those products. They're leaving them set to not be dried out and not be disinfected. And that's a strategy we want to get away from. So make sure to disinfect your mops, uh, disinfect your sponges. You can throw your sponge in the dishwasher or soak it in bleach. That's a great way to disinfect it um, rapidly. The other thing we really promote is targeted hygiene. You don't necessarily have to clean more, just clean smarter and use disinfectants in the right place. So you want to use disinfectants and wash your hands after handling raw meats, after handling dirty dishcloths or cleaning tools, after using the bathroom and after preparing, um, say, uh, meals that that could also and the surfaces with along with those that could become cross contaminated from some of those sources of of contamination. So a lot of people say to me, you know, we can't sterilize the world. Isn't hand washing enough? And hand washing could be enough if you didn't touch your face, if you didn't have the opportunity for recontamination from surfaces um, continuously, and if you hand wash properly. So this was pre-pandemic. 95% of people we surveyed said they washed their hands after using public restrooms. But when we did kind of our hidden camera evaluation, only 67% actually washed their hands after using a public restroom. And about half of those even use soap. A lot of people just did the quick rinse under the water and moved on about their day. Only 16% actually washed their hands properly and long enough, which, by the way, is about 20 to 30 seconds. The average hand washing time was 11 seconds in our, in our observations. I hope that has changed with the increased awareness since the COVID-19 pandemic. We want to do another survey to see how that's maybe changed. But let's make sure we don't go back to these bad habits. The other thing to recognize is another reason why the home environment is something we really want to have control strategies around is that we spend about 90% of our time in indoor environments, whether that be at home or at work or in a restaurant. So this is a, an area where we really have good control. We can apply disinfectants in these environments and we can really limit our exposure by targeting things properly. So nearing the end of my um, presentation here, this is my last official slide is, you know, this is another question a lot of people are asking, are we too clean? Is it bad to be exposed to disinfectants? But with proper use, proper ventilation of the disinfectants and, and the fumes that they might create, um, it's a good strategy to reduce your exposure to pathogens because you won't build, build long-term immunity to a lot of common infections. And some infections actually have chronic illness associated with it, diabetes, um, chronic illnesses, chronic heart disease. These are some of the primary uh, chronic illnesses that we deal with in our society. And some of those can be caused by microbial infections. Autoimmune diseases are also pos possible and chronic sequela from those early exposures to pathogens. And the diversity of pathogen exposure is increasing. We have new habits, new behaviors, new food sources, a lot more activity and interaction with people, at least post-pandemic and, and pre-pandemic um, so we have an increased risk of exposure. And of course, we know now very well that there are emerging and re-emerging pathogens that we need to be guarded against. Also, our at-risk populations are increasing. As we become more elderly and surviving with chronic infections, we also become immunocompromised and more vulnerable to microbial infections. So proper hygiene truly is our best defense against microbial disease and using the right products and following label directions properly is a really good strategy for reducing infection risk. So having said that, I wanna make sure we still remember to enjoy life. Just make some clear, conscious and focused targeted decisions about how to reduce exposure to germs. And I think we'll all live a healthier, happier um, life around, around wellness strategies. And that's really the point. We want to live a, a happy, healthy life and interaction with people and animals, but there's simple things we can do to reduce those risks. So if you have more questions, please feel free to reach out to me. I think we have some time here today to answer a few questions as well. So I'll stop sharing and wait to see what some of those questions are. Thanks so much. Oh, that's great. Thank you, Kelly. How interesting. Um, we got a comment that someone said they're going to take the rest of the day off now to go clean their house. Awesome. <laughs> so, lots of eye-opening information and a couple of questions here. What is the best filtration system to use in my home? 
Yeah, and it really depends on what the contaminants are that you're concerned about. In your area, is there a high concentration potentially of arsenic? In Arizona, we're one of the top five states for natural occurrence of arsenic in our groundwater supplies. So, and obviously there's some regions, especially in older, um, where there's older infrastructure in the U.S., mostly back east, um, lead could be a problem because of those old lead pipes or um, old lead soldering. So it can depend on where you are. But my advice is because you don't always know what contaminants are problematic in your region, a good broad spectrum point of use treatment device is a great idea. And so you can find a lot of different vendors that provide those online, but look for things that have a pre-step with a charcoal filter that can remove your pesticides and your um, organic contaminants. And then look for um, an RO system that removes a wide array of contaminants. And then as a final step, a lot of these um, you know, these multi-train treatment systems will have UV or ozone treatment, and that kills all of your microbes. So look for those systems. Usually they're plumbed in and you need to get a, a plumber or service provider to put them in, install them into your home. But those are the ones that remove the most um, wide array of contaminants that you might be concerned about. Okay, great. What would you recommend is the best disinfectant to use in cleaning our homes? Yeah, you know, bleach is cheap. It's readily available. Um, it's, it's usable in a lot of different applications. Um, so that's kind of the best broad spectrum disinfectant for hard surfaces. Now you can't use bleach on a lot of um, clothing because it, it will harm you know, colored fabrics and it can oxidize. You, know, you just don't wanna use it anywhere where you have carpeting or fabrics and things. So um, for those soft surfaces, we call them, look for a sanitizing spray. So there's lots of you know, very common sanitizing sprays. I don't like to give people name brands, but there's some that have been around for 60 years that are really effective. Um, just look for the label sanitizing spray, but any disinfecting product, um, a product can have a bleach based or another thing that is, if you're concerned about contact with soft surfaces with bleach, you can use quaternary ammonium compounds. They're called quats. And so if you look at the label, if it doesn't have bleach and it's a disinfectant, it will probably have um, the name quat or ammonium somewhere in the label as the ingredient. But the best thing to do, these products are very highly regulated by the EPA. They're all certified by the EPA to be able to be called a disinfectant. So just look for that label disinfectant and see what the label says and how to use them properly. And you can make decisions from there. Just differentiate between cleaners and disinfectants. That's the main point. Okay. There's a question about natural disinfectant sprays. Do you feel that they work as effectively as some of the, the tried and true brands that have the, the non-organic, non-natural that have been around for a while? Yeah, so the natural, the green disinfectants is a tricky category. So some do work and some absolutely don't. So look for that EPA registration number on the label. If the EPA has registered it, that means it's gone through the rigorous testing to prove that it actually kills microbes. If it hasn't gone through that, it's really unproven. And I would say that it's worth looking for a product that has gone through the steps to, to get approved by the EPA. So a lot of us are making our own homemade disinfectants, if you will, like vinegar solutions. Vinegar actually does not pass the muster for a disinfectant to be certified with the EPA, although it will kill some molds and some bacteria, but not the pathogens that I've been talking about that are really the biggest concern with the kind of exposures that I've been presenting here today. So vinegar is a great cleaner, not the best disinfectant. Mm -hmm. Is it okay, this is a two-part question, is it okay to drink tap water? And then number two, will using water filter like Brita be helpful in getting rid of germs? Yeah, so the Brita water filters, and again, read the label and look at their certification. So they also have to go through a certification body. It's And there's multiple ones that do it, but NSF is one certification body. Another is WQA. So look and see what they're rated for, if they're rated actually for microbial pathogens. So not all filtration systems are, not all Brita filters are, but some of them are. So you have to become a really savvy shopper and really read the labels to see what claims that they're making. So, um, you know, the answer to that is a little bit complicated and not, I can't say yes or no, you just really have to read the labels. So that was the Brita filter. What was the first part of the question, Caroline? Is it okay to drink tap water? Oh, yeah. You know, our tap water in the United States is some of the safest water 
you know, anywhere in the world, but it's not a hundred percent. And so we, we know all you have to do is look at the CDC website of how much um, waterborne outbreaks still occur in the U S and especially if you're on a private well water supply, you're not on a municipal water supply, your well water is not regulated to the safe drinking water act. It's your responsibility to have your water tested and make sure it's safe. So if you have a well water private supply, I recommend that you contact your County extension office and have it tested to make sure it's free of lead, free of arsenic, and free of microbes. If you're on the municipal water supply, then you will get a report every year from that municipality listing the contaminants in your water. And so you can make a decision yourself. Do Am I okay? Is it acceptable to be exposed at this level of risk? Or do I want to invest in a point of use treatment system? I recommend a point of use treatment system because the outbreaks, when they occur, you don't really have warning that they're going to occur. And so it's just a safety measure, but they can be expensive and they have to be maintained. If you're not willing to change those filters yearly, then you might be exposing yourself to even more pathogens, even with a point of view system, because at some point that filter gets full and needs to be changed. So there's a lot of complexities around that. And we do a lot of outreach. And if you go to my website at the ezrac.arizona.edu, there's a lot more information about how to make these decisions and gather that information around, you know, what's the best thing for your household and for your water supply. But I don't want to leave people with the impression that we don't have clean water here. We do. It's just when there's a failure in the system, you might be the person that's at risk. One last question. What is the best way to clean mildew or mold off of carpet? Yeah, mildew and mold on soft surfaces can be very difficult to clean because you really need to use bleach to kill the mold spores and let it sit for 10 minutes. That would not be safe for carpet. So what a remediation specialist would tell you is if you have moldy carpet, you should rip it out and replace it. And I know that's a difficult um, answer for a lot of people because it's so costly, but it's really difficult to get mold out of that kind of environment. And if you have people that are ultra sensitive with asthma or allergies to mold, then you know they're, the best protection for them is to replace that carpeting. Well, we've gone a little over our time, but this information was so wonderful and so engaging. We've got so many questions. So thank you so much, Dr. Reynolds, for joining us today and sharing that information. And like many of you, I too am going to go clean my home. (laughs) All those and making sure I wash my hands between the transfer of the clothes from the from the laundry in the laundry room. That's that's another new thing I didn't learn. But anyway. Again, thank you, Dr. Reynolds, for joining us today, and thank all of you for joining us today, whether this was your first time or whether you have been with us over the last couple of months or have been with us from the very beginning of Wellness Wednesday, which we launched last year. We want to thank you. We hope this information has been informative and has helped in your own personal wellness journey. We are going to be taking a little break for the summer, the summer hiatus. However, These helps, these helpful tips and resources are right at your fingertips. We'll be sending you the link. So be sure to check out our Wellness Wednesday YouTube channel, which will show you more than 35 of these presentations that have occurred over the last year that will help you reduce stress, find nutritious recipes, and like today, keep your home clean. So we invite you to make sure that you check those out. And again, we wanna thank you on behalf of our entire team, Allison, Anne-Marie, and myself. It has been our pleasure to have you with us on these Wednesdays. Your health and wellness is important to us. So we want you to invite us to keep, stay tuned with us through our emails, through our social media channels. You will be receiving an email either today or tomorrow with all the information that was shared today. So be sure to keep that if you wanna reach out to us in the future. So again, thank you for joining us today and we wish you a healthy and safe summer. Take care.